Our next step will be to simply enter our first client folder. We click the folder selections box and then we notice that our select trainee study folder box appears. As we look down the list towards the left here, we see some built-in protocols. Your list may be slightly different, but you should see Alpha 1, Alpha 2, ASIM, Demo with Macromedia Flash games, and so on. As we populate this list with additional clients, their names will begin to appear. JD1, for instance, happens to be a client folder, but this list will grow and it will become a library of your client folders. As we then look over towards the right, we see a button called Create New Folder. So our first step will be clicking Create New Folder, and again appearing is a window that says Create New Folder. It gives us a name, a file ID, and a comment. So we begin, I'm simply going to do Bill Test 1. You notice that the file ID scrambles the name and you can also use any of your own formats for client names or client numbers. But I'm simply going to scroll to the right here and we have a button that says use name for file ID. So I'll simply click that and then going back we'll notice that build test 1 appears under file ID. Keep in mind that it's, it's not a good idea to have complete client names, first and last name, because if you're in a small town and you have multiple clients, they're going to know who all of their um, friends and neighbors are that are coming to your clinic. So for privacy regulations, you may want to make sure you're using an encrypted format. Under comment, I'm simply going to type in here for my own notes, test folder. You could put any type of comment here you choose to help guide. For instance, if this is a client and they're going to have multiple folders, you may say this is their SMR folder or something like that. After we've filled this information in, we simply scroll over to the OK. When we click it, we're going to get a confirmation box. This is where we want to make sure we check our spelling. We're happy with the information entered. And again, we can just review that. Once we're satisfied, again, we can scroll slightly over, click the OK. At this point, we get a new box. This box says, New Folder, select a settings file. A settings file is a template of settings that you're going to actually dump into the client folder. So this is a place to start with the protocol we're going to use. We're going to notice, as I grab the little scroll bar, this list is a populated library. And we'll scroll it, we'll zoom in slightly. And then you can see all of the different protocols that we give you built in. Now the great thing is you'll also be able to add to this list. But for now, we're going to start with the top one that says alert beta training with flash games via event wizard. I'll simply highlight. Then I'll scroll over to the right, click the OK button. When I do this, it's going to take the settings from the alert beta training file and dump them in our build test folder. So we hit OK, and we notice a new box appearing called Setup Options. The current trainee study is build test 1, which is the folder we just created. But then we see that the settings from alert have now been dumped in there. Now we're going to go through each of these buttons individually to show you the decisions that you can then either leave as the default of what the settings file was or choose to your liking, change to your liking. We start with data channels. We'll come back to read write settings file later, but data channels is our first place to start. As we click on that, you notice we get a data channels box. And going through some of the options we start, we notice that this will be a one-channel protocol. 
If this was two channels, we would simply select two. If we were doing something such as HEG or one of the peripheral biofeedback measures that will be available later in 3.0, you'll notice this box will then expand with 3.0 and you'll have aux for HEG and then you may have skin temp, skin potential, HRV, respiration and so on. But for now, it's a simple one channel protocol. We then look over filter order. This, we give you two different filter orders for you to choose from third order or sixth order. It defaults to sixth. It's a little slower response, but it's more selective. It's a little sharper of a filter. Oftentimes for a beginner who's just starting into neural therapy, third order tends to be a little easier for them to catch, catch on and get the hang of. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a change and make this third order. Some channel mode, we have on and off. Some, ch some channel mode would only be at, um, applicable to a two channel protocol. So we're gonna make sure that's off when we're in a channel one mode. The amplitude scale is two different ways to measure the amplitude, the microvolt levels. We're gonna default it to peak to peak. Most of the time, you're gonna leave it there. RMS stands for root mean squared, in that if you had older hardware you were coming from, either even our 1.9 software, but the older Lexicore hardware, they often use root mean squared as their amplitude scale, so we give you the option to use either. As we scroll back over to the left, we see save EEG to disk. You don't need to save EEG to disk to review the data that a client has ran. This is simply if you'd want to record it as if you were standing over their shoulder with a video camera. You'll record the raw EEG so that you can play it back with different display screens, different feedback options. But again, for review purposes, it's not necessary to have this on. As we scroll again to the right, we see the artifact threshold and we notice that it's defaulted to 240 microvolts. This is actually the artifact rejection threshold. It's parked way up out of the way at 240 microvolts. Most of the time that's not gonna come into play. As you adjust that from the training screen, oftentimes you'll see it down to 100 or 120. And this would help if a client has a severe eye blink, twitch, or movement, that that piece of data is removed from the statistics and no feedback's given. We then continue down the box to input notch filters. These filters help if there's outside interference in the room, um, laptop screens, fluorescent lights, and so on. In um, North America, 60 hertz notch filter is commonly needed because we have 120 volt and 60 cycle power. In Europe and South Africa and Asia, 50 hertz notch filter is usually what's needed there because they have 240 volt and 50 cycle power. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and turn on the 60 hertz notch filter. It is also important though to make sure that your impedances are good if you're gonna use a notch filter. We wanna make sure that we're training EEG and not just training noise. When we scroll down to EEG data sampling rate, again, we give you two options. It's defaulted to 256 samples per second. That'll be what you'll commonly use. Again, if you wanted your numbers to relate to older equipment you may be moving um, from that was at 120 samples per second, we give you that option to do so. Comport, this is back to the Comport. Before we saw that our Atlantis got installed on COM4. So at this point, we'd want to match the Brain Master software to know to look to COM4 to find its hardware. Okay, as we scroll down slightly, the next button actually allows us to search for COM ports. So this is like a COM port sniffer. The problem is if you have additional devices plugged in, it's going to find all devices, not just the Brain Master. So as I click this, you notice it says found two COM ports, three or four. Well, that's why going to device manager and knowing the exact COM is very important. We know it's COM4, but this gives you a suggestion to try one of these as your COM port. So we hit OK. Our next step is to scroll down. Right below that PC COM button is an electrodes and training info button. As I click that, we get yet another box. 
that gives us our electrode identifiers.